Now, before we start, so I won't forget it, I mentioned a light experience uh, of someone who asked Educacy about meditation. I wanted to give you that quote exactly and give you the number. I use it frequently in writing and talking about meditation. As we find, we will come to see not only the light, but by deep meditation may enter in and become a portion of the light that may bring helpful healing attributes to the psychological conditions of this body. That's for a woman who was working with meditation, had started working with it, and had caught a glimpse of sort of flash, and she was asking about her uh, light experience. This is 774-3. And you may want to read the whole reading because it's a it's an interesting uh, reading. Yes. Mr. Lutu said, Your work will gradually become concentrated and mature, but before you reach the condition in which you sit like a withered tree before a cliff, any of you want to look like a withered tree, <laughs> there are still many possibilities of error which I would like to bring to your special attention. These conditions are recognized only when they have been personally experienced. This is an interesting comment here, and one that I feel is, is very important, that, that we constantly uh, evaluate and look at, not what somebody else is telling you, not even what Herb or I or anybody else is telling you, uh, but that you work also in relationship to your own personal experience because that's the pace at which you're moving and it relates I'm sure to the past experiences that you've had both in this life the blocks that you've set up and also past lives where you've worked on or fallen away from the meditative process because this just all doesn't happen in a moment uh, it takes work and the personal experience is so important here for you to move on the basis of that, in my opinion. I shall enumerate them here. My school differs from the Buddhist yoga school, Chang's tomb, in that it is confirmatory signs for each step of the way, in that it has confirmatory signs for each step of the way. Now, we've been talking about signs and so forth. First, I would like to speak of the mistakes and then of the confirmatory signs. When one begins to carry out one's decision, care must be taken so that everything can proceed in a comfortable, relaxed manner. Too much must not be demanded of the heart. One must be careful that, quite automatically, heart and energy are coordinated. Only then can a state of quietness be attained. During this quiet state, the right conditions and right space must be provided. One must not sit down to meditate in the midst of frivolous affairs. That is to say, the mind must be free of vain preoccupations. All entanglements must be put aside. One must be detached and independent. Nor must the thoughts be con concentrated upon the right procedure. This danger arises if too much trouble is taken. I do not mean that no trouble is to be taken, but the correct way lies in keeping equal distance between being and not being. If one can attain purposelessness through purpose, then the thing has been grasped. Now one can let oneself go detached and without confusion in an independent way. You made a good statement on that uh, the other day, Herb, that in-between state. I, I think it's well worth emphasizing. So, um, demanding too much of the heart you know, a lot of people, you go here, there, or something, you say, well, let's meditate. Now, there are circumstances in which that can be done, and there are circumstances when it can't. You mustn't. Now, the fleshly heart, remember, we're talking about this, that goes out and flutters when it's under stress or something. You can't expect it to be still and quiet under every condition. You can't sit down and meditate under frivolous circumstances. So there have to be some choices made about a right place. Then the other side of it, but you must take too much care. If you have to have a certain place, you have to have a certain condition. If you can't meditate unless you've got your incense, or if you can't meditate unless you have your favorite chair, 
then you're you're making too much requirement of the the Chinese I think because they're so interested in balance have these interesting ways of of uh, expressing that if one can attain purposelessness through purpose then the thing has been grasped you know one of our problems I think in the in the East and in our Western civilization is our, our concern with time uh, we're in such a blasted hurry. Uh, the Chinese act as if they've got a million years ahead of them, and they probably have. Uh, we've got to get everything done right now, tomorrow. If something doesn't happen, uh, I think our demanding, and I hear so many of you, and uh, every once in a while you come up with, uh, how, how do I get answers here in meditation? I'm going to meditate and get something. And I think that is another demanding thing that you you must be very careful with. Uh, meditation, as I understand it, is happening within, and it's a letting process, not a driving, pushing. Uh, it, it's like a child after a balloon. You you kick it, it keeps going away from you if you keep grasping for it and running after it. You've got to let it and to demand that you're going to get an answer, you're going to get something out of it, uh, will frequently defeat you from, from the position that, that you're in. These things come. Meditation will prepare you, and they'll come. Uh, they're given in dreams. They're given in experiences after meditation. They are given uh, uh, because you're prepared by the meditation for a, a receptive state. Not that you get it in the meditation at that moment, right when you want it, right now, on the dot, delivered. Uh, you cannot force it like this, or you, you lose it. Sometimes, though, the American consciousness thinks being practical means demanding results. And one of the World Affairs readings, if I interpret it correctly, it, it seems to suggest that China just might come to rule the world because of its willingness to grow slowly. And um, this, this attitude of willingness to grow slowly is maybe the more sound and therefore the, the more practical. We moved into uh, San Antonio where there are not many trees and at the time we bought our house people were encouraging us to buy uh, Arizona ash because it would grow quickly and about that time one of my colleagues where I was working his father um, just passed away he the day before he died and he knew he was going to die he put out a whole um, a couple of dozen or something pecan trees which grow very slowly now in contrast to planting the Arizona ash so that you'll have shade within five years or planting con trees that don't even begin to bear until they're 12 years older or more. This, this is the, the real consciousness of growth and productivity. It's quite a, quite a there country. is really plenty of time, believe it or not. <laughs> you said that was something that you read earlier this week that said uh, we must demand much. Oh, one must not content oneself with small demands. To me, that relates to the purpose for meditating. You mustn't, you mustn't content yourself with a notion, I'm meditating so that I will um, reduce my blood pressure or I'll reduce my anxiety level. I'll find the fishing words. All right. Well, you know that. <laughs> but rise to the realization that all living creatures are in need of redemption. That relates to purpose. It must be quick and a very, very high a sense of purpose because every one of us can make an input into the whole system the, the readings say literally that many a city many a nation has been saved from destruction by the prayers of a few now I have a feeling that, that the prayers of a few that were efficacious in that regard came from people who were practicing the silence not just people who were saying Lord Lord great meditators right no <laughs> doubt <laughs> <laughs> Furthermore, one must not fall victim to the ensnaring world. The ensnaring world is where the five kinds of dark demons disport themselves. 
Remember that's five. That's an interesting number in connection with senses. This is the case, for example, when after fixation, one has chiefly thoughts of dry wood and dead ashes, uh, and few thoughts of the bright spring on the great earth. In this way, one sinks into the world of the dark. The energy is cold there. Breathing is rough. And many images of coldness and decay present themselves. If one tarries there long, one enters the world of plants and stones. Now that's enough to scare you right away from meditation for the rest of your life, if you read it <coughs> literally. What, what's going on here? What's it saying? What are these dead ashes? And... Uh, these, um, the coldness, thoughts of coldness and decay present themselves. What is this, Herb? I'd like to come in on it too, but let's both do. Well, um, it suggests to me uh, thoughts of dry wood and dead ashes of empty thought forms. You enter into a thought form world of the emptiness and, and discarded thought forms. Then also... It had no light that have no life. And, and you, they may represent themselves as being real or alive to you, but they're dead. They're, they're shells. Now, there's another. There are certain approaches to the, let's say, occult in which you enter into an aspect of the spirit world that is cold. You, you can experience it. Sometimes you go to, not necessarily every time, but you may go to a seance or something like that, and there's not light and warmth there. There's a coldness. And then you enter into um, this world of plants and stones, and, and I think literally the uh, concept of elementals is here. You, you find this notion of elementals in not only the readings and esoteric sources, but in the Bible. There's a warning about elementals. You know the Finhorn experience? The, the people could tune in on the mole deva, or the tree deva, or the plant deva. The, these are elemental spirits, and there is a psychic consciousness that you can tune in to. Dorothy McLean, who was one of the original three uh, Finhorn people, and the, the Finhorn psychic who tuned in to the Davis, describes her encounter with the mole Deva. You know, the moles were in the garden, and Peter said one day, uh, Dorothy, you've got to talk to these and get them out of here. And so reluctant, she, she, she said she had never had such a dismaying um, sort of uneasy feeling as to confront that the Davic force related to the moles and he was not at all happy about her request she said you could work over there in that field we're trying to work here and he very very begrudgingly faced her but the next day she said you could see the, the trail going right out there and they had taken themselves out but, but this is this is a level that you can enter if you meditate, if you're sitting there and meditating and, and getting the psychic forces going that are not directed toward life and light and spring and things joyous. Uh, let me give you an example of two from the, the readings here. We have a, a series of readings for a gentleman by the name of Nine Hundred, And in this, he began to have experiences related to these shells, these empty shells, the thought forms. You and I think that thoughts disappear. And, uh, you know, it's a little flickering on our brain, and that's it. It isn't so. Thoughts create. They are things, and they live on. And they are given more and more energy. And they live because of the energy that we give them. Now, uh, these take form. And uh, he saw these shells. He moved in and among these shells. And the reading that he described this... Uh, that described them for him and talked about it, described that in just that way. These shells. These are shells of people. They're not individuals. They're not entities. They're dead shells that have been left. They're active enough. There's life in a kind of... But you give by because you seek. You reach out and touch this kind of thing. Don't move in those directions. If you do, you can go off down the corridors with these entities. They begin to give you information. Uh, you're not talking to souls, you're talking to shells. You're talking to thought forms. And um, it's very clear. This coldness is really interesting. 
I have been in, this, I'm sure, as many seances as there are people here and then some. And there are whole experiences related to the cold constantly. How many times have you heard ghost stories that related to coldness, air blowing, cold areas that you move a hand through or touch? Uh, these are the areas of the, uh, this uh, thought pattern world. Uh, it, it's not real. It's, it's thought world. And uh, they're not anarchists. Most of the time. Now, now in that, they break through from the other levels and come through and where it's needed. But uh, most of it is, is a thought world that you're messing with. And if you go off, you run into this. In your movement, like you're moving on a... I've described it like an elevator. You go up on an elevator and, and because somebody's pushed the buttons, and you push them sometimes because you want to see what's happening on that floor, that elevator doors flies off and you open and you see all these... Interesting things going on out there. Don't get off of the elevator. Uh, because if you do, and follow them down the corridors, even though they're very interesting, um, don't do it. Because uh, you stay on that elevator. Because you're headed with a different purpose, a different ideal. I'm going to read you some readings on this in just a, a little bit, as soon as we get a little deeper into this, uh, on the warnings regarding it. And they are centers. They, you go off at the centers. Their thought forms are connected with the tie-ups that you have that are built into your centers. You birds of a feather flock together. You attract exactly what you deserve, not something that's rushing in there and can't get in. It gets in because you've got something there that relates to it and is attracting it, and that you, you don't want to uh, deal with. So the ideals and the purposes, he'll say in a reading here in just a minute, accept nothing but the highest, head for the top, and, and don't get off the elevator here. Wow. These uh, uh, statements here, and I'll read them quickly. There's just a couple of them. Uh, in the body, we find that which connects the pineal, the pituitary, and the lighty. It may be truly called the silver cord, the golden cup, which may be filled by a closer walk with that which is the creative essence in physical, mental, and spiritual life. Now, he's talking about the centers, of course, there. Now, uh, over here. There are channels through which all the forces do manifest. To some, they are the voices heard. To others, there is the vision seen. To others, there is the impression of feeling or the presence of those sources from which information may radiate. The lighting or closed gland is the keeper, as it were, of the door. Now, that's that lower center they, they, that we've been talking about. Uh, and would let either passion or the miracles be loosed in the expression of the attributes of the imaginative forces in their manifestation in the sensory forces of the body whether to the fingertips that would write, to the eyes which would see, to the voice which would speak, or to the whole system as would deal the impressions attuned to the infinite, to those just passed over, to the unseen forces. Uh, for the world of the unconscious is not a material change from the physical world, except as to its attributes or relationships. Whether the vision ha has been seen or lowered depends upon the height the depth, the breadth, or the length the entity has gone for its sources of supply. Be satisfied with nothing short of universal consciousness, guided, guarded by the Lord of the way, or the way itself, in him, capital him, is life. Why be satisfied with a lesser portion than the whole measure? That's 294-140. Uh, this is a clear statement of heading for the top. That's why we emphasize the ideals, the, the, the goals, the spiritual aspect of this whole business of meditation. With that holding on to that, I think you're safe. But uh, you play with anything else, and it could... Uh, I would venture inward, but uh, these, these are direct from the reading. These, I've got this, as I told you before, under... A very strange heading. It should not be there, maybe, or maybe it should. <laughs> it has to do with um, the question of ESP in mental cases. You know, are you reading it? Yeah, if you uh, if you have trouble visualizing this, um, you've heard of astral projection, right? You can imagine a circumstance in which there's a physical body, but a consciousness that moves out of it. Now, if you had a choice, which of the two would you want to talk with? Would you want to talk with the body or with the one that part that had moved out of the body? Now, take it another step and imagine that 
that one who's moved out of the body moves into another plane and leaves a shell, a shell behind it. And then which of the two would you want to talk with? And, and why talk with the shell when you could talk with the essence? He is uh, listing some mistakes and we've uh, come to a couple of them. One, too much must not be demanded of the heart. Two, nor must the thoughts be concentrated on the right procedure. This danger arises if too much trouble is taken. Three, one must not fall victim to the ensnaring world. That's the dark demons and so on. And then the fourth, nor must a man be led astray by the 10,000 ensnarements. This happens if, after the quiet state has become, begun, one after another, all sorts of ties suddenly appear. One wants to break through them and cannot. One follows them and feels as if relieved by this. This means the master has become the servant. If a man tarries in this stage long, he enters the world of illusory desires. All sorts of ties appear. What kind of uh, ties do you think? I've been trying to think about that. I, the ones I've run into are the ones that I was just talking about that I created, my desires, the, the uh, patterns of... Um, who was it the other day here? I'm not comparing myself with this man. That told me that he, he had an experience where he saw a figure on the beach running and he thought it might be a naked woman and he zeroed in on it and it turned out to be an Arab uh, all dressed up in a galabea. Um Ties. Uh-huh. Uh, I run into uh, uh, all kinds of things in, in this world at times and you have to go on through them. They do pull at you. They do... do uh, they senses. stir you up. Mm-hmm. In senses of limitation. Desires, desires limitation. I was, I was talking with a man a few years ago. He, an uneducated man, uh, but he said he could do uh, out-of-the-body travel at will. And he said, one night I was out of the body. I came upon another person. He introduced himself. He said, I'm Paul Twitchell. Follow me. So he, he went with him. And... Um, and they were going along and looking at several things and there was in the distance singing and light and the man wanted to go over there but his self-appointed guide said no that's Jesus and his bunch we can't go over there and so he went on now he told me a year later he learned that there really was a man named Paul Twitchell who teaches astral projection all right here was a tie that because he had come upon a consciousness now, some of you may have been helped by this work. I've, every time I am critical of another work, someone comes up afterwards and uh, fusses at me because they say that that was very meaningful to me. But I'm just telling you the stories the man told me. I really wonder, though, if he hadn't followed that limited guide, if he wouldn't have been better off to have sought his own experience. But... You see, your experience may not be that dramatic, and yet you may be moving in consciousness and get caught up with something that you follow that's an interest of yours or a desire pattern of yours or a sense of obligation or a sense of limitation. And and you don't just push it aside. You follow the strings or you let those remain and keep you from moving in the consciousness. That would be as easy as just say, Hey, I'll see you later. I think I'll go over here and and follow that higher, possibly higher calling. I uh, am reading a book right now by a psychiatrist who has uh, set out to set out in his life pattern to make a study as an anthropologist too, and uh, his reading is trying to become a shaman, and he's gone went into the tribes of the Amazon and began to take those drinks and so forth that they prepare that move them like the LSD experiments into all kinds of uh, visionary patterns. And they're demons and devils. 
and they are the devils and demons of those tribes. And he, to become a sharing, he's got to go through and face each one of these and uh, pass through them, go on through. Uh, he's moving toward trying to help, use the practices of the, the ancient uh, witch doctors and so forth of those tribes to uh, learn how to use and how to help. Um, that's a hard road. This man's uh, uh, suffering. Uh, in his experiences. And we, we've had people that have tried these. You've read books about this business of uh, the experiences of going back into living through the dinosaurs. What was that book? It was by um, a woman we had here to talk, and she went under LSD experiences. It, it, now, her name never appeared on it, but um, it was a famous thing. Um, oh, it was all over the place. Yeah, though, it was uh, a no. Yeah, it was Adele. Davis was the one that did it. But her name was not on it. But uh, she went back to the world of the uh, dinosaurs and the moths and went lived through all of that and got involved in it. Um, she was a brilliant lady and, and, a girl, and helped, has helped a great many people. But she had a rough, rough deal on that. Uh, don't go these routes. It's, it, uh, you can get caught in this area and there's a better way a lighted path I keep calling it a lighted path that we need to follow not a uh, this business of, yeah it's getting into that world of decay that world of, uh, of you know everything becomes rigid and get caught in Getting into a rock is terrible when you get to... <laughs> let let okay, me comment me about... Say that for a thousand years. These seven centers are tuned at the end to different dimensions and different possibilities of consciousness. So we can imagine levels associated with each. And as, we, as the energy moves, the consciousness moves. See, the consciousness is invested down here and in meditation it's raised. And as it moves... These are sensory systems. It's just like an eye. The seven centers are eyes. And they, they move you in consciousness into a dimension. Now, they have their respective biochemistry, hormonal secretions. And you know, the thing about drugs, the experience is not in the drug. The, the drug, whether it's uh, marijuana or LSD or what have you, it has a lock and key principle. The drug has a certain potential, and it responds in the body because there's something in the body, like a lock, and that dr drug acts as the key. Now, the idea of, of meditation is we produce our own hallucinogenic drugs. But, as you take the various drugs, or have them, then they relate to the chemistry and the psychic potential of these centers. So, you can take one drug, and it's chemistry opens the key related to this center and you go out in this plane of consciousness and you meet that. And so the various cultures have discovered uh, because different drugs were used by their shaman or they were handy or something, they've discovered these consciousness altering potentials of them. But just because it's consciousness altering doesn't mean that it kind of opens a door. It, it simply opens uh, a level at the elevator. And what Helen is saying is, don't don't let it get don't let your consciousness get off just because the elevator door opens and you see something's out there. Now what what the drug does? It kicks you off. See, it just you, you just get off at that level and you find yourself dropped in that. Uh, you don't shut the elevator's gone. <laughs> <laughs> but none of these drugs fit just exactly because you're unique. Your body chemistry is not like that of any other. And the only drug, say, related to the pineal or pituitary that's just right for you is that one that you produce. Now, here's an example of what I mean. Oxygen unites with the blood and carries it along and then releases it. But carbon monoxide unites with the blood in exactly the same way. It's the blood presents itself in the same way, and carbon monoxide is close enough to oxygen to attach in the same way. But... It doesn't release. That's why it's poisonous. So just because the drug gives the effect to make the combination doesn't mean that it's going to have a desirable long-term effect for you. 
I've, I've used an illustration with this that, that the drug, use of a drug kind of thing, is like taking a blue torch and burning a lock off of a door in order to get the door open into the unconscious. Now, you can do it. But from then on, you haven't got a lock on the blasted door. And you can't close it. The door doesn't stay shut. Keep things keep coming out and things keep going in that you, you have no control over. Uh, it's so much better. Herb's been talking about this. Uh, these cells of Lydie, remember we talked about a movement to the uh, pineal right here. It's, it's up above physically, but, uh, and the light, the pineal being connected with, with light. Uh, there is, they have found this hallucinogenic that is secreted by the, uh, you have those things, I think, the, the uh, medical reports of a secretion secreted by the pineal gland that is more powerful than uh, any hallucinogenic that man has found yet. Now, they've even in, in synthesized it and injected it back and get some remarkable experiences with it. But this then enables to spill over into this cup idea and the whole thing come back down and cleanse rather than going along and opening this or using some temporary stimulus to open these centers as you go. It's a very clear statement. This next uh, paragraph here deals with some interesting things that you could get real caught up in. At best, one, at best now, one finds oneself in heaven. At the worst, among the fox spirits. Such a fox spirit it is true, may be able to roam in the famous mountains, enjoying the wind and the moon, the flowers and the fruits, taking his pleasure in coral trees and jeweled grass. But after having done this for three to five hundred years, or at the most for a couple of thousand years, his reward is over, and he is born again into the world of turmoil. Have any of you ever read a description anywhere of the um, coral trees and the beautiful places that you could go in one of the major religions of the world that's kind of fanatical? Did you ever read a description of the Mohammedan heaven? Hmm. Really? <laughs> in the Koran? You ever read that? It's an interesting uh, business here. It's very interesting. Now, the uh, involvement of the emotional capacity of those people and their ruthlessness in religious fervor. Well, they were worse than the Catholics with their inquisitions. And they were pretty bad. They were worse than the Crusades, or as bad as the Crusades, for sure, in chopping people up in the name of their God. And still are, as you know. Um, interesting. And we all go through these, you see. We all go uh, through these different incarnations and pick up these things and then we remember them when we begin to move and we run into something like that and this is beautiful. We can take off here. We can enjoy this beautiful place. Don't stay there. You, you can stay for 500 to 3,000 years and then you have to get back to the rat race again. It's better to deal with it now. I haven't seen it in the Taoist text, but it's certainly in Hinduism and Buddhism, there's talk of the wheel of samsara. And the wheel of samsara has, say, six categories. This would be the level of human existence, and this is a kind of heavenly level. But as you move through the wheel, there's, there's the demons and the wild animals and the tame animals and so on. And the movement is through this. And yes, there may be ways to move out of the human level into a certain kind of heaven for three or five hundred years or even a couple of thousand, but it's because this is a karmic wheel and you're working on karma, then that uh, sees its full extent and you're back. You haven't been liberated just by moving in consciousness or gaining that kind of or cashing in on that kind of good karma. That doesn't mean liberation. The whole idea is to get out of that wheel. That is to say, not be working in the law of cause and effect, but in the, in the law of grace. Then, um, one comment about fox spirits. I've been very interested in the symbology of the dog. 
uh, began uh, reading Goethe's Faust, and Faust, who was a seeker, one day, one, Chris, one uh, Easter morning, goes out for a walk, and a black poodle follows him back, and then when the poodle gets in his study, he's transformed into Mephistopheles. And so I began wondering about what is the symbology of the dog, and in the Revelation, then, we have the sevens and the sevens and the sevens, but then there's a reference, and the eighth was of the seven, and yet there's a, a beast that is, and yet is not. And I think it's an aspect of one of these centers that, and, and I'm associating the dog with the fox spirit that is the psychic ability kind of gone astray in the sense of it's going to do its own thing instead of say, not my will but thine. Then, with the psych that psychic ability, you can have these glorious experiences that are symbolized by roaming in the famous mountains, enjoying the wind and moon, flowers and fruits, pleasure in the coral trees and jeweled grass. This is a fun part of the, uh, scary but fun part of the secret of the golden cloud. All of these are wrong paths. When a man knows the wrong paths, he can inquire into the confirmatory signs. The purpose of this section is to call attention to the wrong paths while meditating so that one enters the space of energy instead of the cave of fantasy. The latter is the world of the demons. This, for example, is the case. If one sits down to meditate and sees flames of light or bright colors appear, or if one sees bodhisattvas and gods approach, or any other similar phantasms. Or, if one is not successful in uniting energy and breathing, if the water of the kidneys cannot rise but presses downward, the primal energy becoming cold and breathing rough, then the gentle light energies of the great earth are too few, and one lands in the empty fantasy world. Or, when one has sat a long time, and ideas rise up in crowds, and one tries to stop them but cannot, one submits to being driven by them and feels easier. When this happens, one must under no circumstances go on with meditation, but must get up and walk around a little until heart and energy are again in unison. Only then can one return to meditation. In meditating, a man must have a sort of conscious intuition so that he feels energy and breathing unite in the field of the elixir. He must feel that a warm release belonging to the true light is beginning to stir dimly. Then he has found the right space. When this right space has been found, one is freed from the danger of getting into the world of illusory desire or dark demons. Herb, you know we should stress the fact that this is constantly using the word fantasy here. These things are not real. You make them up. Your unconscious is capable of the most fantastic dramatic dramatics. It can appear in any of a thousand forms. The, the funny uh, you know, kids fairy stories are full of this sort of stuff. Remember the cat puss in boots with the uh, org in the castle who was able to turn into an elephant or become a mouse or a roaring lion and scare the daylights out of the rabbit? Uh, you know... Uh, this this whole business of oh, the cat he scared them he scared the cat the cat brought him rabbits uh, we make these up they're out of our that's why I said a while ago that we, we attract and, and manufacture uh, what we are akin to what we have experienced now it's true we tune into the evolutionary patterns of the earth and they have form and have and we see them but then we make up stuff. We, we manufacture and keep manufacturing uh, as we go through these experiences. So it's a fantasy world. It's, and when you face it, as the shaman and the, the, uh, or the people with dreams out in the Sinai, out mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, they teach their children to turn around and face the tigers that are chasing them and the demons and the devils, and, the, and they disappear. They, they change. But... Um, just don't get caught in that. It's a fantastic world, but uh, you've got another job, and another, we've got another place to go. Just a couple of comments. One, if we think of uh, consciousness as this um, 
relationship of the finite and the infinite, and we're cut off from that, then I can uh, diagram this difference between the space of energy and the cave of fantasy. Or we can do the same thing here. See, we can say short of the highest goal, we're into the subconscious. But our subconscious, the readings say, all subconscious minds are in touch one with another. So we get caught up in this cave of fantasy, moving through. Now, Edgar Casey, you're all familiar with this story, right? That when he began to give a reading, he started to follow that dot of light. And he knew if he didn't stay with it, if he got off, then he would be lost. So he moved through, I think, those planes that are being referred to here as the cave of fantasy. So that he would get beyond that. And this is... Um, it's just really interesting, amazing. I'm sure Hugh Lynn has seen it so much more than I have, but people come, they've had experiences, and they, they know, they've read or they've heard of lecture, they've been told, don't follow that. But they say, but I feel like I should. It's so interesting, or it's so beautiful, and they want to follow it. They want to rationalize or want me to give permission or something to say, oh, yes, go ahead and, and check that out.